to stand up and read verses 3. No, verses 8 through 11. Verse 8. that uh, you all could see chapter 3 does have the intention to give the uh, exhortation of a work that is worthy of God's calling. Well, the Apostle Paul was going to uh, give such an exhortation, he just couldn't uh, stay away from telling people what can person he was. This means he tells us how he had a work that was worthy of God's calling. In his telling of his work, he referred to us his life as a prisoner, as a steward, and as a minister, and also he told us the revelation given to the apostles and the prophets concerning Christ for the church. At the same time, he just cannot avoid in telling us the riches of Christ because his kind of work was under the influence of the revelation of Christ. And his revelation of Christ is mainly <clears throat> concerning the riches, even the unsearchable riches of Christ. So, in this parenthetical word, the unsearchable riches of Christ are spontaneously referred to. Now, as... Uh, we are considering ourselves also as some kind of uh, apostles and prophets. We also have to need, uh, well, we also have the need to know, to see the unsearchable riches of Christ. Here, I feel burdened to say this to you. In Christianity, the wrong concept is that the apostles, the prophets, for the universal churches and the elders for the local churches, not universal churches, the universal church and the elders for the local churches, these are the high officials. Right? These are the persons in high positions beyond the uh, laymen. Right? Beyond the the uh, regular common believers. But I do believe in his writing spirit, he realized that uh, this was wrong. So he purposely uh, wrote this parenthesis, showing us that uh, the apostles and the prophets uh, are not extraordinary people with high position and rank higher than the ordinary believers. 
No, not in this sense. Rather, in the way he wrote this section of the word, you can see that uh, he just gave us an example, a pattern. The most they could only be considered are the leading ones, are the leading ones. You see, among the saints uh, in all the churches, they just take the lead. You see, they take the lead to walk this way. They take the lead to uh, receive the revelation concerning Christ for the church. They took the lead to live Christ. They took the lead to experience Christ. They took the lead to participate in Christ. They took the lead to enjoy Christ. And also, they took the lead to minister the riches of Christ to others. Otherwise, if they are extraordinary people and exceptional class of people, then we have no share in enjoying the riches of Christ. Right? Here, he's talking about the unsearchable riches of Christ for our enjoyment. If this kind of enjoyment is only available for the high class, ranked people, then we have no share. You see, this is not logical. But, logically speaking, he gives us such a record, showing us that he was less than the least of all the saints in enjoying Christ. So, what he can do, we also can do. You see? What was available to him, it was more available to all of us because he was less. He was less than us, right? And we are greater than him. So, if anything was available to him, surely it should be available to us. Have you seen this logic here? Now, we must be convinced that the apostles and the prophets, even the stewards, and the minister, these are not an exceptional class of believers. They are just ordinary, right? They are just the leading ones. Like the elders in the local churches, they are not extraordinary people. They are not of the high rank, higher than the other believers. No, they are just leaders taking the lead in living a church life. So all the saints just follow them. We must take this kind of a concept into our being. We have to drop that in the law recover, there's not such a thought of rank. I used to say rank is rank. In his thinking. Right? No rank among us. The most, we have some leading ones to take the lead. Right, to leave the church life, to leave Christ for the church life, and we all just follow them. Now, they are not hair. We don't hair. We don't have a hair cross on the hair rank among us. No, just forget about that. We have no leader, right? The Lord Jesus' word is more than clear in Matthew 23. He said, you have no leader. You have only one leader. You have only one master, right? You all are brothers, right? We all have to drop this concept. Oh, who is the apostles? Uh, who are the apostles? Who is the elder? Who are the elders among us? You should forget about this. We all are sheep, as -E -E H-E-E-P. We all are sheep, right? The most, the elders, the apostles, the prophets, they may take the lead to set up an example, a pattern, how to know Christ, how to participate in him, how to experience him, and how to enjoy him, and how to gain him, to have the true sign that we may dispense him to others. Right? The most, it is just a matter of pattern, 
a matter of example. It is altogether not a matter of an office, and the uh, rank, and the uh, uh, position. We all have to drop this concept concerning office, position, rank. You know, here, just to, uh, about two minutes ago, I. Uh, said something in this way among us. We don't have the apostleship. We don't have the leadership. We don't have the eldership. We don't have any seat. No seat. Now you understand what I mean. We have no seat, but we still have the apostleship in our sense. Right? Could you follow me? Okay. That's good. Now, for us to be an apostle <laughs> and a prophet and a steward and a minister, even the best, a prisoner in Christ, we need to know the unsearchable riches of Christ. And this is for the producing of the church to be the fullness of Christ. Well, I give you a list of all the uh, innumerable items of what Christ is. Number one, the riches of Christ are uh, depicted in types. I believe even we this morning, about 2,100 people here, everyone all of us would spend some time to study the Old Testament to find out how many types of Christ. I am afraid we cannot do it. You may say, well, how come that we cannot do it? How come? Because some types are hidden there. It is, it is there. Yes, you couldn't realize. Have you ever realized that the earth first entered the deep water and then it came, uh -huh, it came, emerged to the surface uh, in Genesis 1? Have you ever realized that earth was a type of Christ? And I cannot tell you how many types of Christ in Genesis chapter 1. Number one, I just tell you a few. Number one, the light there. The light there, right, is a type of Christ. And number two, the earth there is a type of Christ. And number three, the sun, S-U-N, is a type of Christ. And number three, four, at least one star, the morning star, is a type of Christ. Have you realized? You just tell me the truth. And among the trees, you know, in Genesis, right, large trees. Could you tell me how many trees are the type of, types of Christ? One tree? <laughs> how could you say one tree? What one tree you tell me? Huh? I don't know the tree of life. What's that? I don't mean the trail of life. The trail of life is wonderful. It's meat serious. It may be in chapter 1 of Genesis, I doubt. But anyhow, it is in Genesis chapter 2. <laughs> the tree of life is in Genesis chapter 2. Whether it was there in Genesis chapter 1 or not, I dare not to say. Because this is a mystery. You just put this aside, I tell you, at least you can mention two trees, maybe more. What two trees? I tell you, first of all, the vine tree, right? This here in John 15. And second of all, you have the apple tree in Song of Songs. And that apple tree is not the washing the apple. It's different. That is not the apple tree in the uh, in the what in the cold district. 
That is kind of an apple tree in the semi-tropical, semi-tropical district. So you have another tree, the tall tree, cedar tree. Do you realize in the Bible, cedar is a type of Christ? How about this? And you have a city which is called Cyprus. It can separate tree. And that is also a type of Christ. This is why it's hard for us to tell us to tell how many types in the Old Testament of Christ. Not only the trees, have you realized? Even the herbs. Right? Don't forget at the Passover, you know, the children of Israel, they ate not only what? They ate not only the lamb, they also ate another two kinds of plants. They ate the unleavened bread of wheat. So wheat, you see, is a type of Christ. And also they ate bitter herbs. And the bitter herb is also a type of Christ. Right? And uh, among the crops, not on the wheat, you have other things. You have what? Barley. The barley. Right. You have barley. You have wheat. Oh, I just can tell you, in Genesis chapter 1, too many types of Christ. Many trees, uh, many crops, and many grass, herbs, uh, flowers. Right? Could you tell me uh, what flower was a type of Christ in, uh, in the Old Testament? Ah, uh, right or not? Yes. You see, Psalm of Psalm, chapter 1, does say you are the henna flower. But today, we don't know what the henna flower. But now, there is a kind of flower. Yeah? That was the type of Christ. Is this all? No, not yet. So, yeah. So, you have uh, what? You have... Uh, I tell you, a man created by God as the type of Christ. Right? Many things in Genesis 1. Young brothers and young sisters, surely you have to realize I'm not boasting. This book has been in my hand over 56 years and a half years. I'm in the Bible. 56 and a half years, nearly not one day I didn't touch this book. And the more I got to know this book, the more I realized I know little. It's too little. It's too little. I am not boasting. If you would give me the time, the Lord agrees with you, I tell you, I can sit down to write messages just on Genesis 1 to write another 100 messages. You think I'm boasting? I'm not boasting. <laughs> I'm not boasting. And most of the messages will be on the types of Christ. You see? Why you have the light before the sun comes up a typifying Christ. First, then why after this light, on the fourth day, you have the sun to shine out and to typify Christ? A lot to say. A lot to say. The Bible is profound. The Bible is too, too deep. Unless you get into the depth, you couldn't see the riches from the surface. What is here? Right? The first day, there's evening, and there's morning, it is the second day. And then there's the morning, evening, and there's the morning, and it is the third day. Just like this. This is on the surface. But underneath, there is the riches, you see, of Christ. So it's hard for us to tell how many times in the Old Testament. 
here it says in types. Just in types, you have the types of uh, the luminaries, right? The uh, light, the sun, the star, and you have the types uh, of uh, of what? Of the plants, right? And uh, you have the type of the animals. You know, some animals are types of Christ. It doesn't sound so well, right? But I tell you, uh, you have a, a lamb, right? A lamb is the type of Christ, right? And you have a cow, a type of Christ. And you have a lion, a type of Christ, right? And you have also a dove, a type of Christ, right? And you have also a big eagle, a type of Christ. See, have you ever thought about this? All these are types of Christ. You see? And then you have the persons as types of Christ. You have Adam. You have Abel. You have Enoch. You have Enos. You have Noah. You have uh, uh, Isaac. And you have Joseph. And then you have Moses. My, you have too many. You may have what's a type of Christ. And then you have all these uh, uh, priests as type of Christ. And you have the kings. And you have the prophets. Am I right? You have the uh, Nazarites. How many persons who were types of Christ? Could you tell how many? It's impossible. It's impossible. But anyhow, just this one time, one item, types, many, many. Oh, you have also... Uh, the minerals, the minerals, right? You have uh, 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 the uh, uh, silver, you have the gold, uh, even you have the, uh, uh, the iron. <laughs> all these metal things all are also types of Christ. Okay, I think good enough. <laughs> These are types. Then you have shadows. And, and you have also figures. I know. The Bible students are all bothered to know the difference between types and shadows. And the difference between types and shadows, and the difference between uh, shadows and figures. Before I'm going to tell you something, I'd like to bother you. I'd like to ask Jiang Su to tell us what is different between the types and shadows. And following this, what is different between shadows and figures? And what is different between types and figures? Three things here, right? Types, shadows, and figures. Uh, you may say, it's all about the same. I tell you, it is not all about the same. You see, all the human faces are the same, right? Yes. Why? You see, you have two eyes, I have two eyes. You have one nose, I don't have two noses. Right? And you have three ears, I don't have one ear. We all have two eyes, one nose with two nostrils and two ears and uh, uh, two leaves, of course, probably not the same number of, of teeth. But the same number of a tongue. We all have a mouth, a tongue, two lips. You see, generally speaking, we all are about the same. But actually, <laughs> about millions of faces, billions of faces, not two are the same. Not two are the same. Still a difference. You look at Bill Freeman and John Inga. Right now, <laughs> they are all long faces. All long faces, right? But still, these two long faces are different. Right? Look at them. And I don't know how to describe Gene Groder's face. Is that a kind of long face? I don't think so. Is that a kind of long face? I don't think so. Is that a kind of triangle face? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't know. Yeah? Here we have a brother. You miss his face is square, a square face. 
draw signs, you see. <laughs> but still, two eyes, one nose, two ears, one mouth, two lips, and one hand, right? And all the hairs on the top, right? And all the beers at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> But still, there's a difference. Okay, John, please tell me what is the difference between the times and the shadows? Say it. Well, <laughs> times maybe uh, uh, a. Uh, as you just shared, a general description pointing to Christ, whereas shadows may be referring to the laws uh, uh, and the rituals in the Old Testament. Just like Hebrews uh, said about uh, the laws, are uh, just shadows uh, of uh, Christ and things. Very good. good. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way to make a decision that we have to go to the word of the Bible. <clears throat> the first place that the word shadows used for Christ is in Galatians chapter uh, 2. No, in Colossians, I mean. Uh, Colossians chapter 2. You see, all the uh, new moon and the uh, uh, holidays, uh, Sabbath, all these things are shadows. You see, all these things are shadows. Colossians 2, 17. You see, you are right. These are shadows. All the uh, laws, the ordinances, the uh, uh, ceremonies, you see, in the Old Testament time. And these things are shadows. But uh, Aaron was not a shadow. Aaron was a type. You see, uh, Moses was not a shadow. Moses was a type. Adam was not a shadow. Adam was a type. You see? <clears throat> now, these things, like uh, the Sabbath day, right, and the uh, a new moon, and the holiday, and uh, other uh, rituals, ceremonies, uh, uh, ordinances, and these things are, strictly speaking, shadows. They are not types. They are just a shadow, a shadow. See, you cannot say Sabbath was not a rest. It was a rest. But that rest is not so real. Am I right? It's not so real. It was a shadow of the real rest. Am I right? And uh, the law is to not say that was not a law. As a testimony of God, you know, the law describes what can God who gives the law is, right? So the law is a description, is kind of explanation of God. That means the law is the testimony of God, but the law was a shadow of Christ being the real explanation, definition, and testimony of God, right? I, we, as we mentioned Already in other occasions, a law always describes the lawgiver, right? A good man gives a good law. A bad man gives a bad law, right? Then God's law gives a picture of God. So the law is a kind of a testimony, explanation of God, but the law was just a shadow. The real picture, the real definition, real explanation, and testimony of God is Christ. So the law was a shadow. Am I right? Uh, now we see at least a little bit. 
between the difference, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the difference between the uh, uh, tab and the shadows. Now, what is the difference between the figures and the tabs? Yeah. It's not bad, you see. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have to praise the Lord. Even the young people in the Lord recovery can know the Bible in such a wonderful way. I'm sure they are excited and encouraged. It's absolutely right. I tell you, you may say the times, the times, always referring to a person or a certain item of things. You see, for instance, the tabernacle was a type of Christ. The figure, you are right, mostly refers to a situation that gives us a picture, a view, a view. You see? For instance, the uh, children of Israel wandering through the wilderness. That was a figure of our wandering life. Am I right? That's a figure. A figure. A kind of a view. Right? A kind of view showing us <laughs> uh, what the Christian life today is. The Christian life today, according to our experience, is just a wandering, wandering life, like what is portrayed. You see, what is depicted there in the uh, journey of the children of Israel. Now, it's good for us to uh, to uh, 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 see this. Um, you see, the land at the Passover was a tent. But the Passover itself was a figure. Am I right? The lamb was a type. Right? But the Passover feast, yeah, the Passover feast, that kind of situation is a figure. It's a figure. This pack, the, depicting how Christ is our Passover, saving us from God's judgment and uh, releasing us from the tyranny of Satan. Am I right? And uh, feeding us with what he is. And uh, also bringing us out of the tyranny of Satan, crossing the river. I tell you, all this picture is a figure of Christ. How about this? Now, Christ is too rich. He's so rich to such an extent he needs not only the types, not only the shadows, but also the figures. Right? In the old husband, you have so many types, numberless types. And you have also the shadows. And you have also the figures of Christ. All these are just descriptions. So descriptions, explanations, definitions, are depicting what Christ is. Brothers and sisters, if we are going to know some doctrines in the Bible, we better know these kind of doctrines. See? To know the riches of Christ. Then we go on to D. In prophecies, my, what wonderful prophecies. 
Could you tell me what was the first prophecy concerning Christ? Huh? Very good, you see. I'm again encouraged that the young saints in all recovered, they know the Bible so well. I tell you, I'm afraid even many, many so-called ministers, they couldn't tell you what is the first prophecy concerning Christ in the Old Testament. It is Genesis 3.15. Predicting that Christ was going to come, or was coming to be the seed of woman, to bruise the head of Satan, the serpent. <sighs> Just that one verse with this little title, the seed of woman, you know how many things imply? Do you know how many things imply? <laughs> It implies Christ has to be a human being because he has to be a seed of the woman, right? And it implies he has to be born of a virgin, nothing related to man because he is the seed of woman, right? In the Bible, all the descendants are called the descendants of man, right? Even though all the descendants were born of mothers, but they are not called descendants of women. They are called descendants of certain men. Am I right? Not only uh, uh, in ancient times, even today. It's no argument, right? No argument. But in the whole universe, there's one man that is not the descendant of a man, but the seed of a woman. And this implies what? Well, this implies he should be born of a virgin. Is it point? My, I just give you a little. You can see the riches here, the riches of Christ. And he, as such a seed in humanity, born of a woman, destroyed the head of the subtle one, the serpent. Just this one verse, Genesis 3.15, could show us a lot of riches of Christ. Then you go on to such a verse, Isaiah 9.6. My goodness, how, how many rich atoms here. You see, you see what? Unto us a child, a child was born. Unto us a gift, a son was given. He is a child, he's also a son, and his name is called, how many names? Seven names. This and that, this and that. The biggest name is the everlasting Father. The eternal Father. Right? The eternal Father. My, all the reasons here. And could you tell me how many prophecies concerning Christ in the Old Testament? Even this morning, sorry, I cannot tell you. Probably I spent some time, I content, probably, I forgot. But I do hope some of you young sisters will do this. How about? For next time we come back together, you please tell us, brotherly, we have found out how many prophecies concerning Christ in the Old Testament. It's not bad. If you have the time, but list of them and uh, ask the printer, uh, maybe, you know, the instant printer, a printing list, and you bring the list to us. I'd like to get a copy to see how many prophecies in all the Old Testament concerning Christ. Concerning this aspect, I can tell you, that short book, Zechariah, has more prophecies concerning Christ. It's rich. Many. Many, even in details. 
So the riches are there. Now we go on to fulfillment. <laughs> you have the prophecies first. You have to find out the, pro the fulfillment in the New Testament. Sometimes, you know, the prophecies of the types in the Old Testament, when they were fulfilled in the New Testament, they have something added. More than it was prophesied. The fulfillment sometimes is richer. It's more than what is, uh, what is uh, 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 prophesied or typified in the Old Testament. I give you an example. We all know the land, L A N B, in the Old Testament was a type of Christ. But in the Old Testament, it was never called the Lamb of God. Of God is, I tell you, a big thing added. Yeah, a big thing added. You may see the Lamb of Abel. You may see the Lamb of Abraham. Right? You may see the Lamb of Israel. Offered by the Israel. Right? But in the Old Testament, you don't have the Lamb of God. In the New Testament, we have the Lamb of God. What an addition. Study the Bible in this way. To find out the times, then to find out the prophecies, and also to find out the fulfillment. The fulfillment. Uh, some uh, Bible students, uh, including myself, we were all bothered sometimes uh, the fulfillment verses, you know, in the New Testament, quoted from the Old Testament, sometimes with some additions. Uh, I, when I was young, I thought uh, the New Testament writers uh, were too free. They shouldn't add something to the Holy Word. See, uh, the prophecy just said that much. And then they add something. They added something. And that was not so good when I was young. Later on, no, you shouldn't say that was not so good. I tell you, you know what? Let me say this. The prophecy say, so, yeah, I illustrate this. The prophecy concerning Christ like this. The fulfillment of Christ like this. You know what? The experience like this. You know the experience like what? You don't understand like what? The experience of Christ like this. Actually, this is not the addition. This is what? This is the prolonging. Christ can never be limited by the prophecy. When he came to fulfill, he fulfilled more than what was prophesied. And then we come to experience, we experience much more. Much more. Am I right? We experience not only the Lamb of God, but we experience the Lamb of Eternity. Prophecy is always short. Fulfillment is always longer. And I tell you, our experience must be longer, 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 longer. Endlessly longer. Why? Because Christ is endless. Am I right? This was why when the New Testament writers quoting the Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ, sometimes they added something. They added something. Then now, when they experience the prophecy with the fulfillment, I tell you, we don't add anything, but it prolongs. It prolongs the riches of Christ. Then we go on. The plans. Oh, I surely lack, even now, some young sons, maybe this time some young brothers, will bear the burden, or pick up the burden, and go back just to study this one thing, to find out how many plans. 
are the types of Christ. How many plans, you know, show us the plans of Christ? I mean, the riches of Christ. Some grass, some trees, some flowers, uh, some uh, crops. They all are uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, pictures showing the riches of Christ. Then the animals I mentioned already. And then the minerals. <laughs> Do you all realize that Christ is the precious stone? You have to know the precious stone is altogether what? A composition of minerals. Right? Uh, better stay with the Bible to find out what minerals are showing the riches of Christ. Now, I just cannot have the time. Of course, you know, how could we have the time just in one session covering all the riches of Christ? It's impossible. It's a joke. Right? The minerals, and then the person. Ah, yeah. Right? As we have seen just in that one book, the book of Genesis, you have eight great persons. Nearly all of them are typifying Christ. Adam, Abel, Enos, Enoch, Noah, right? Then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Actually, more than eight. All these great persons are uh, depicting the different aspects of this one person, Christ. And all the different aspects are riches of Christ. You see, some riches of Christ you could see in Adam. Some you could see in Abel. And some you could see in Abraham. Some you could see in Isaac, in Jacob, in Joseph. You see, then you go on to the end of the Bible. My goodness, how many persons were there showing us the different rich aspects of this one person. In the Bible, I mean, in the New Testament, we only have four Gospels. Actually, I don't think a four-day Gospel would be adequate to portray this one person. You see, the persons, okay, then. All the passive things in the universe. All the passive things. Too many passive things. Am I right? You just mention a little bit. The air is a passive thing. Right? The gravity. Gravity of the earth is a positive thing. I tell you, that is Christ. The real gravity is Christ. Probably you have never thought about it. We, we all know without the gravity, we all will fall. I don't know where. <laughs> we will fall where? I don't know. But we all are held. Don't say, I'm standing here. Our standing means nothing. Am I right? If the, the earth doesn't have gravity, do you mean your standing means something? It means nothing. Right? The gravity means everything. And that gravity is Christ. Christ, surely, he has the holding power. The Hebrew one says he upholds the universe. You see? All the passive things in this universe just depict. The riches of Christ. Then what? I like this last one. All the human virtues. Love, kindness, humility, patience, endurance. All these human virtues and all the divine attributes. Forgiveness. You see? And forbearance. All these divine attributes. 
both human virtues and divine attributes are Christ. Are the riches of Christ. I tell you. Now, I must speak the truth again. In Christianity, I never heard things like this. You see? It spent us years. I don't know how many years. Gradually, gradually. From the studying of the word, from observing all the situations in the universe, and from our own experiences, we have learned to know, my goodness, all these things are the riches of Christ. And this is why when he was on this earth, he could pick up anything as a parable to himself. And he could pick up anything. He could pick up the door. He could pick up everything. Because he was everything by that time. And he's still everything. He's everything. He's there. He's the gravity. He's the light. He's everything. You see, if we do have the real love, our real love is he. Am I right? If we have the real patience, our patience is he. You see, if we have the divine forgiveness, and this is just Christ. Christ is our divine forgiveness. I tell you, if we thought Christ, we cannot forgive anyone. Could you forgive me? Even you could not forgive your wife. Right? Without Christ, I don't think any husband would forgive the wife or any wife would forgive the husband. They would rather remember till they die. They would say, you don't you shouldn't forget. What about you? You did that thing to me. <laughs> you tell with the history. Many <laughs> wives, when they were dying, they still say this. You have to remember. 45 years what you did to me. While the wife was dying, he still would say this. We don't have any kind of forgiveness. But we have a good memory. <laughs> right? But when we have Christ, I tell you, the divine forgiveness comes. He is our forgiveness. We can not only forgive, praise Him, we even can forget. We can forget. We just have the divine forgiveness because the for, for divine forgiveness is just the forgetting. God forgives us means he forgets our sins. Christ is this forgetting. So this is Christ. Too rich. It ought to get too rich. Then what? The riches of Christ are for producing the church. All these riches are for one purpose. To produce the church this is through the divine dispensation of Christ into the believers. We see this. The church was produced not by teaching, not by forming, not by organizing, but by what? By the divine dispensation of Christ into the believers. The more dispensation of Christ into all of us, I tell you, the more life we have. The stronger life we have, the better life we have, the richer life we have, the more uplifted church we have. It all depends upon the divine dispensation of Christ. This is why I always say I hate the poor mere teachings. But I love the ministry that ministers Christ to others, dispensing the riches into the believers, then we have a proper, richer, uplifted, and stronger life of the church. Then be by the believers experience and enjoyment of Christ. You see, on Christ's side, it is a dispensation. But on our side, it is experience and enjoyment. We just experience and enjoy the very Christ who is dispensed into us, then we are a part 
a good part of the proper church life. Roman number three, this is to express God's multifarious wisdom. Multifarious, not many, but many aspects, many kinds, from many directions. This is God's wisdom. Well, I do believe you can realize to cover this in maybe we have to give 10 or 15 messages just on the multifarious wisdom of God from different directions. Of course, we cannot do that, right? We don't have the time to do it. And this is expressed to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly, mostly the evil powers of Satan. God led to demonstrate to them God's multifarious wisdom to show them how wise God is. Don't think God's salvation is so simple. It is not simple because it is showing God's wisdom in a multifarious way. That God's wisdom is of many aspects, many directions, many uh, kinds. Uh, this is also according to God's eternal purpose. We know this. Then lastly, resulting in the fullness of Christ. I must ask you to pay your full attention to the difference between the riches of Christ and the fullness of Christ. In the same book, you do have these two expressions, two terms. In chapter 3, you have the riches of Christ. In chapter 1, you have the fullness of Christ. In the past, since 1962, I came to this country in uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, Paato, Beria. I gave a message there on the difference between the fullness and the riches of Christ. And in some other occasions, even in any hand, at least, I give my message concerning this. I do believe most of you have heard this message. I just give you a simple, brief reputation. I'm a man standing here. Or I better, again, take a big American gentleman. Okay, suppose this is the big American gentleman. I tell you, this is the fullness of America. Why? Because this man is composed with the riches of America. All the riches in the supermarket. It's a chicken, egg, milk, orange. Uh, all the American riches. They are the riches. They are the, not the fullness. Until this riches You eat, and you digest, and you assimilate, until they become you. Then they are not the riches. They become you. You are the fullness. Could you follow me? All the rich items of Christ are the riches of Christ. Still, they are not the fullness of Christ. Until we eat them, we enjoy them, we assimilate all the riches of Christ into our being. Then we all become the body of Christ. And this body of Christ is not the riches of Christ, but the fullness of Christ. Is this clear? This is the fullness of Christ expressing Christ. Any fullness is always the expressing. Am I right? So the body of Christ is composed with are constituted with all the riches of Christ enjoyed and assimilated by us. Then the body is here. The body is the result, is the issuing of the enjoyment of all the riches of Christ. So the body is the fullness, is the expression of Christ. I think good enough. We must have uh, at least, I think, 15 minutes for sharing. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media 
or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministry.